Morning, everybody. Um, right, I think it's about time we made a start. I think there might be a few other people joining in the next few minutes, um, but it'd be good to make a start for now. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to what is now our fourth Sharing Leading Practice event of our 2021 partnership year. Um, for those of you who haven't joined a Sharing Leading Practice event so far, um, these are what were formerly known as Leadership Development Days. And these are an opportunity for schools with um, accredited areas of excellence to share best practice. Um, and we're really thrilled to be able to offer a diverse programme of virtual events this term. I think whilst COVID has presented a huge amount of challenges for people, um, it's also a real positive with how easy it now is um, to, to share excellent practice, the length and breadth of the country. Um, so I really hope that you will be able to join us for some more of these as well. Um, for now, though, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Michelle Forrest. Uh, Michelle is the head teacher of St. John Fisher Catholic Primary School, which is part of our Aspire Hub, um, which is um, in, in Liverpool, or the Liverpool region. Um, Michelle's done a lot of work in her school around the vision of the school and how this has impacted the culture and the community. Um, and, and she's got some really interesting things to share with you for this session. Um, so just before we make a start, um, I just wanted to go through a few uh, sort of housekeeping bits first of all. Um, so if you haven't already, please do mute yourself. Um, that's Alt A or Star Six if you're joining by phone. Um, it just helps to uh, keep the session running really smoothly and prevents any background noise. Um, please do also introduce yourself in the chat. So if you say your name and what school you're from, and if there's anything in particular that you would like to get out of the session. Um, there will be opportunities to interact with each other throughout the session, uh, technology permitting anyway, um, but please do type any questions that you have in the chat as we go along, either questions for Michelle or for the wider group. Um, there should be some natural pauses as we go along um, when these can be answered and I know that Michelle has also um, factored in some time for questions at the end of the session. Um, I'll send around a feedback form at the end of this. Um, I'd be really grateful if you would be able to fill this out. I'll pop it in the chat and send it in an email as well. Um, feedback is really, really important to us and it does um, help us to shape future events as well. And then just finally, we will be recording this session to share with others who are unable to attend. Um, if you don't want to feature in that recording, then please do let me know. Uh, for now, that gives me great pleasure to pass you on to Michelle. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Michelle. Okay, so hopefully, can you see my screen? Does that need to be? Um, we can't see it properly presented. That's better. Perfect. Okay. All right then. Um, good morning everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Michelle Forrest and I'm just um, sharing our vision, driving culture and curriculum in our school. Uh, the deputy head of our school, Michael Brooks, is also in this meeting uh, and he's joined us so that he can also think about what we've done as a school, but also maybe later on be able to answer some questions that you have and, act, and add some extra uh, information. So uh, before we start looking at vision and culture and curriculum in our school, I was thinking a little bit about leadership and what's the main role of a head teacher. So when I first took on my very first leadership job as a, an English lead, my head teacher at the time told me that my job was to raise standards in my area. She told me I might introduce new things, I might revamp the reading scheme, I might do all those little things, but everything was aimed towards raising standards in English across the school. And I think the role of a head teacher and a senior leadership team is very similar to that. We do so many things every day. We write policies, we deal with behaviour, we work with um, parents, we look at recruitment. But everything that we do is focused towards the most important areas of our school or the areas that are most in need of improvement. And that's what this is all about. OK, so I looked at kind of how does a school system improve? And I looked at this report from McKinsey from 2010 and it looked at education systems across the world. And what it found was that any any school system can improve from any starting point significantly. But what it really found was that the most important um, factor in that improvement was that school leaders set the vision and direction of the school. That was the most important thing and the biggest contributor to success. I then looked at Rutherford in uh, his research in 1985, so it's a long time ago now. And he was looking at behaviours that characterise an effective school leader. 
and you can see them on the left hand side there so it looked at they've got clear informed vision of what they want their schools to become they focus on that vision for all their students and their needs and then they really importantly translate these visions into goals for the schools and expectations for their teachers and everyone else in that family and so I know it's quite early on, but I just want us to think about leadership at this point before we think about vision. And I want us to think about, you know, what kind of leader are you? What are your leadership challenges? What are the things that we, you find hard because nobody gets it right all the time? And also, is there a leader that you respect and look up to? Now, that might not be necessarily another head teacher. It might not be somebody in school, um, but who's that leader that you look to as a role model and what makes them stand out from the other leaders you know? So I think um, Georgina is going to put you into breakout rooms now, just for a quick, you can introduce yourselves a bit more so it's less, it's less formal, but also have a chat about those things and really think about what does leadership mean to you and what you see and respect in other leaders. Okay. Thank you, Georgina. Um, I think it, there's quite a few of us, so it might be quite hard to take feedback uh, from individuals, but I'd be really uh, grateful, I think it'd be useful if in the chat, uh, if you've got any particular feedback that you'd like to share about what kind of leadership you look up to and what makes a leader stand out. That'd be helpful for everyone, I think, if you would like to um, add something in. Okay. I'm going to move on now to um, some leadership styles that um, Hill talked about in a Harvard Business Review article. And you've probably um, heard of this and seen this before. So there were, he, he looked into, it was school leadership, and he looked into five leadership styles. And the five styles were the philosopher style. You've got, it, you've got to try and match the, the name to the little picture now. That's a little task for you as well. The philosopher, the soldier, the accountant the surgeon and the architect and each of those leadership styles was really effective in different ways and had different things that they did but there was one um one style or one leader that was still seeing the fruit of their success years later and that was the architect and in rob carpenter's manifesto for education he describes that architect leader as insightful humble and visionary and i've got a small clip there so if you do get these slides you can look at um this link here to the article but it shows you the impact those leaders had over time. And all of the leaders are successful, some start out much higher. But after three years, the leader that was still seeing the fruit of their success was the architect. And that was down to having that vision and embedding that in, his, in their schools. So I think now, if we move on to thinking about uh, how we go about creating and developing a vision, and the really hard part for us uh, is embedding it, I think. Okay, so. First of all, I wanted to look at the difference between vision and mission. And I think these, can, these words can be sometimes used interchangeably, but to me, they mean really, really very different things. So we're a faith school, and if you're in a faith school, your mission is intrinsically linked to the faith. Uh, and that's what, when I, when I arrived in this school, we had a lovely mission statement. And the mission statement was walking in the footsteps of Jesus, live in faith and learn in love. And it, it really let people know who we were what was important to us and, and what we were about, I suppose. But it wasn't a vision for success and school improvement. So that was something that when I came, I wanted to look at and change. And we didn't, it's, for me, it's not either or, and I'll show you the difference in that now. If we look at the vision column, it really outlines it's where you want to be, not where you are. Not, it, it is still about what you're about, but it's where you want to be in the future. And that's the main difference to me. So in St. John Fisher, this is our mission statement. So we talk about that we believe in the light, so you'll be children of the light. It's a gospel reference, and we break that down into what that looks like for different parts of our, our school community. We've got a child in the light, a school in the light, and a community in the light. And we describe what that is and what happens, what makes us different. And that is really closely linked to our faith, and that's really important. We don't forget about that. But the thing that drives our school forward is the vision. And this is our vision. So um, our vision is quite simple. At St. John Fisher, we strive to create a school community where children and adults achieve their full potential and shine. We will achieve this through engagement, high expectations, and by treating all with respect and dignity. That's our vision. We have a little strap line, which you'll see over here, at St. John Fisher, we shine, and we use that a lot. So the vision works on different levels. If you ask our children what the vision is, they will talk about this bit. If you ask our staff what the vision is, they will talk about this bit. And I think that, that's okay. It's all linked, 
but everyone knows what that vision is, what, what it means and where we want to be. Everything in our school is about enabling our children and our adults to achieve their full potential and shine in every area of school life. So if we think about how you get a vision, um, we have to start with the why of the school. And Simon Sinek does some work around this. And he, I mean, he's got a book that's called Start With Why and it's the Golden Circle. And it starts here in the middle. It starts with why do we do what we do? We know what we do. We teach and counsel and support families and encourage attendance and all those other multitude of things that we do. We know that, but we need to have that shared purpose and vision. And I believe that although it may be similar in every school, it's unique. It's got to be unique to your context. And that's why it's got to start with you. And it's got to, you've got to come from the inside out. Don't start from what we do and work out a vision coming back in from it. You start with what you want to achieve and then everything builds on that. And Steve Radcliffe, if you've ever read any of his books, Leadership Plain and Simple is really effective. And he says, leadership's not about your competency, skills and personality. It's about being in touch with what you care about and then going for it. And that's really, really what it's all about for me. So his model, Steve Radcliffe's model, is future, engage, deliver. So let's look at the future, engage people with it and then deliver, which is really clearly linked to Sinex, why, how and what. Start with the future, start with the why and build out from there. And all of that is lovely linked to our beloved intent, implementation and impact. You can see where they got it from. You start with that why, then how you're going to do it, and then what's the outcome going to be. And I think we need to really get to grips with what we care about. So here is a list of personal core values. It's not exhaustive. It's just, an, it's just a starting point. But I want us now to reflect really about what you care about. And it has to be what about you. It's your core values. Now, you may already have some words that you've seen on that list. You might have some language that you wanted to kind of think of. That's really important to me. When I was starting our vision, a really key thing for me was respect. That was, that was key. And that came from what I'd seen in other schools that I'd worked. And also, I saw how important that respect was because I saw what happened in that school. It's not there and it's not evidence in school. So for me, that was massively important to be part of our school. So what's important to you? Okay. And what are your core values? When you've got those in your head, then think about how do they translate into your school, for your pupils, for your staff, for your community. So I want to just give you a, a minute or so to kind of make a couple of notes yourselves. What, what would you say your personal core values? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for that, everyone. I hope that was useful for you. And I just wanted to give, um, because you've all been separate breakout rooms, just a, a minute or so. And if everyone in, in the chat could just write down either what your core values are, or how you think they would translate, or something that you've just kind of gained from that chat room, that would help everyone out. So I'll just give you a moment to um, kind of write them down, and I think Georgina is going to share some of that with um, the group. Thanks, Davina. We've got um, autonomy, communication, fun, loyalty, and ambition so far. Sounds good. I think that autonomy, yeah, that's, that's important at the moment as well. In, in a lot of schools where maths, maybe you don't have as much autonomy, that, that has to be important for you as a leader. Yeah. Uh, we've got from Joy, um, striving for greatness, educational achievement, moral compass. Um, from Bethan, we've got strength, individuality, purpose, and compassion. That compassion is so important, isn't it? It, it? You know, having and having that moral purpose. But it's not all about the education, academic side, is it? Absolutely. Uh, from Shruti, we've got. Um, she says we have six core values, which are empathy, courage, gratitude, self-discipline, respect, and integrity. Um, and she's also saying we now teach the character virtues more explicitly in lessons too. 
I've got lots coming in now. Um, Rather than our children to be knowledgeable, confident communicators, to grow in empathy, to be inspired and to be creative. And then from Diana, we've got three mission words. So belong, believe and achieve and seven core values. Um, I think this is Michael from your school, Michelle, I can't tell from the name. Uh, respect, teamwork, engaging and perseverance. It's interesting to see how many people are kind of highlighting empathy, compassion, that kindness for others. And I think it's so important, you know, and we can talk about it especially now, but always it's really important that, isn't it, to, to be teaching our children those values, not just to pass that. Mm. And then just one more from um, another Michelle, actually. Um, family is a main value and respect, collaboration, adventure, integrity, generosity and joy. Oh, sounds lovely. I like joy. I think somebody else has joy as well. And that should be on everyone's uh, vision as well. OK, thank you very much. If we, if we uh, kind of move on. Um, so now thinking about maybe creating that vision. So it's, this is Steve Radcliffe again, who I mentioned before, and he talks about powerful and effective leaders, us, that's us we're talking about, are, are guided by the future that they want. And the more connected we are to that future, the more we will be able to drive it, the stronger we are. So we have to believe in that, what, that we have to believe in the vision that we're selling to our school. So this, this picture really does, says it for me. It is about a team, but it has to start with you as the leader. If you don't believe it, it's not going to be effective. It's not going to spread out. So it is a team and we are going to look at sharing it, but you have to believe it as the leader. So in sharing the vision, um, these are things that you've got to do. You have to tell people about it. We have to ask people what they think about it. Nobody likes something that's thrust upon them from the top down. And that's something that we worked really hard in our school to make sure that people were involved in that. Um, it should start with you and your leadership team. So that's, that's where you begin with. You start with you, you talk to your leadership team. You're going to be the ones driving it. So you as a group have got to believe in it. Then consulting other stakeholders. So what does that vision look like and feel like to the wider community? Is it inclusive enough for everyone to buy in? That's really important. Or does it feel as though we're thinking about a certain group? Is it too elitist? Is it, is it catering for one part of your community? more than others it's got everyone's got to buy in for it what would other people add or take away you know we had lots of sessions where you know i'm a big fan of big pieces of paper and getting ideas down and kind of then distilling the information we did a lot of that this is what the vision looks like now what do you think have we got it right what would you add what would you change would you take anything away that was a big part of what we did and we did that with the staff and we did that with governors and we did it with parents first of all we also did it with children but a little bit later on and then I think it's about acting upon that feedback, but really keeping true to your core values as a leader in a school. Yeah, we share, we consult, we do all those things, but it's got to, as I said before, you're leading it, so it's got to come from you. So in our consultation, something we changed quite early on is that we added and adults into our vision statement. So we started with children, so it was about getting children to achieve their full potential. And then during the consultation, it changed to we added teachers that was that was just kind of significant say that was just about a specific group so then it changed again to staff so we had went from kind of just children then we had teachers then went to staff and then after a while it kind of thought well actually this is about our whole school community so that staff disappeared and it became adults that has really helped us to include absolutely everyone in what our vision does and what our school is about the consultation and the collaboration meant that our vision was being talked about it also meant that people felt that they were important because we did change things, we did discuss it, we acted upon feedback. Um, and I didn't realise how much impact that change would have at the time on our school overall. The difference it's made is that as leaders, we're not only looking at how we can improve life chances for the children, it's life chances for everyone, the staff, at every single level. When we look at professional development, we always look at who's missing, who hasn't been included in this, who are we not given that chance to achieve their potential. So just that little tiny ad addition of and adult made a massive difference. And we've also now got a school dog. So it's pretty possible that we may have to go back and review it. So it's children, adults and animals. So watch this space. So what I'm going to say here is, this is key, and I think you'll all know this, but it is about being authentic. So 
Simon Sinek again says, being authentic is when you say and do the things you actually believe. We will all have been somewhere where you know this is the party line, this is the big picture, but what actually happens in our school is different. If we want it to work, we've got to believe it. And if you don't know the why, you'll never be authentic. And that's why the collaboration and the sharing has got to happen. We want people to believe us because when we're authentic, then people trust us that we've got the right thing in mind. We've got the, the heart of the school. So it's first why and then trust. And I really do believe this. Once you know your why and you believe in it, everything else is easy. Since we got that vision in place, things have fallen into place for us as a school and it feels quite easy. And your people will come and kind of go, oh, well, that's it because that links with that. And people don't feel like it's another thing. It all links to the one purpose, which is for our children and adults to achieve their potential. So if we think about now you've got your vision, you've agreed with it and everything else. It's now about that embedding stage of it. So here, go back to Simon Sinek's uh, golden circle. So he's got, what you need to embed it is you need that why, that clarity of the vision. The next bit then is the how, is the pedagogy. How are you going to work towards that vision? And make sure that's understood by everyone at an appropriate level. What is, the, what is it looking like? What is the pedagogy in your school about how our students learn best? And everyone needs to know that at the appropriate level. So for example, our admin team do not know exactly how we teach in every single lesson. However, they know that when we teach, we have high expectations and we want our school and our curriculum to be engaging. They can talk about the vision at the level that is appropriate for them. The what after that is the things that happen every single day. So you need the clarity of your vision. It needs to be crystal clear. Everyone needs to get it. You need to be really disciplined about once you've decided on what the how is. So if you know how you want your teachers to teach, if you know how you want your students to learn, you have to be disciplined in monitoring that and making sure that that's happening all the time. Then the consistency. What are we doing outside? What does our curriculum look like? What does our culture and our school look like? They're the things I think that are really key in embedding your vision. It just keeps coming back to this. And this is embedding again, and I've put this on because this is what I think is really important. It is repeat. I tried to find a picture that said, eat, sleep, vision, repeat, but I couldn't find one. So I've just got the repeat button instead. Everything comes back to the vision. Everything. Why are we doing this? Does this, whatever it is, help us move towards our vision? So look at everything through the lens of that vision once you've got it. Look at the new initiatives. Do they fit or is it something, just another new thing? Does it work? Does it help people fulfill the vision? If not, you don't do it. Look at the old practices that you've done with a new eye. Why do we do behaviour in this way? Why are the reward systems looking, looking like this? Should it be changed so that it fulfills our vision? We're now looking currently at our appraisal system. So for me, I've never really thought the process of appraisal has been really effective in improving teachers. So at a recent Challenge Partners event, uh, Chris Moyes um, spoke about uh, his growing great teachers. And so we're now looking at changing our appraisal system because I want something, I want appraisal that helps our teachers to achieve their potential, not just prove what they've done over a, a previous year. So everything again, back to the vision all the time. So important, once you've got your vision and you're embedding it, is making it visible. So this is something we did quite early on. Once we had it, we had a little bit of a launch, not massive, but we shared it with everyone. We made it visible, but also it has to be lived. Um, you know, it's not just about laminating things and sticking it up everywhere. Although I think there are a bit of legs in that. It reminds people that that's what you're about. But it's not just that. You have to live it. You have to speak that language all the time. Children, staff and parents have to know it's not just an exercise that you've ticked off because someone's asked you to do it if you mean it and you believe in it. So challenges, because it seems straightforward, but it's not always that easy. So the challenges we had. We had those people who maybe were mood fevers, people who um, had cynicism about this. You remember the last time we did something like this? The people who rolled their eyes in staff meetings because we heard it all before. We had that. We had the time pressures and we had people who were panicked or weary about this as being another, another thing that we do, something else to fit in. How do we do this? What's going to give? So we had that as well. And we also had those outside pressures. 
and you can see what they are and we've all got them we've all got that we've all got offset waiting we've all got things that go on in the community we've all got behavior issues and i think it can be really easy to go for the quick wins when things like that happen uh, but that that means that your vision's not driving things so you know <laughs> an example might be you know a, a teacher saying listen i know it's really important michelle that everyone shines but um, year six, we need loads of support because we've got sat at the end of this year. So can we have that? T you know, it's kind of like everyone gets a little bit looking at things from their point of view. It's about us as leaders saying no and continuing to go back to the vision saying, is this the right thing to be doing? Does this help us to achieve our vision? So these are our solutions. The solution to those mood hoovers and cynicism and all those things is passion, positivity and praise. So when you see people live in the vision when you see something happening that really drives you praise it you make a big deal of it you include it in your reward system you reward and staff you reward and children we introduced new ideas and initiatives as a way to achieve that vision so when we brought in um voice we were looking at voice 21 um, and we looked at that as being something new that wants to bring into the school we talked about how this would help our children achieve their potential because they will become better communicators. So staff are seeing that we're not just doing lots and lots of separate things. Everything we do links together and is, is aiming towards us achieving that vision. And it also, the solution was giving ourselves the permission and the courage to say no. To say when something came in, this is not going to work for us. This isn't important for us right now. It might be in two years. But you have to give yourself a little bit of permission and courage and have your governors believing in that vision as well to say that and keep going to the balcony this is a little thing that i like to i i like to think about every now and again you have to just step right back and kind of looking at the balcony it gives you a bigger picture of the whole room go out and look at it again with fresh eyes is this the right thing really really important so i want us now to think about those challenges because they do they are hard and they do block things in school and I wanted you as, as you know, leaders to think about what challenges have you had when introducing something new in school and what did you do to make a difference? So again, if we just kind of give you a minute or so to um, jot down some ideas of challenges you've had and what, what made a difference or maybe, maybe you didn't overcome it, maybe that challenge actually stopped something happening. What could you do or, or maybe in the room ask somebody else what would you have done? So just a minute or so to talk, to think about it and then into the um, breakout rooms. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Georgina. I've just turned my video off, everyone, because I think my screen was freezing a little bit, so I'm trying to, hopefully this will help you to still be able to see and hear me properly. Uh, so I hope that was helpful, sharing that, um, what challenges you've had and what you did to make a difference and maybe supported um, somebody else. So if I move on then, the difference is that our vision has had in our school, the impact it's had, just as an overview, you can see on the screen now. It's made the way we think about recruitment change. We don't look so much at experience and qualifications anymore. We look at who will help us achieve our vision, who fits our school. That's something we've looked at. We've definitely seen an impact in attendance, um, and that is across children and adults, which fits together with our vision. So our attendance is regularly uh, above local and in line with national, if not above. Persistence absence is really low, um, and our staff absence rate is much lower than the national average. So we recently looked at some data, and I think in, in on average, teachers are having or staff in school uh, have four days off a year on average you know it spreads across in our school that's one day so it's a big impact and we do believe that the vision helps that we believe that it helps that our, our staff to feel valued and want to come in it's definitely had an impact on uh, the growth of our school the school's gone from um, being an intake of 18 children in reception three years ago to being oversubscribed for the past two years and, and having lots of appeals. We've got we've opened a school nursery. We've grown the school along with this vision. Um, standards have increased. We've still got to work on it. You know, we're not there yet. We've definitely got to work on greater depth. We know that, but we're on that journey and we're moving towards it. Um, and we've also looked at the pride in our school people are proud to come to our school the reputation in the local area and beyond is growing and I, and I believe that's because we've got a clear vision a clear aim and we're all working towards that one vision and it's communicated well so people will talk about us shining we put it on everything our twitter social media and um, parents will write letters in about it it's always about shining we, we, we bring that everything back to the vision all the time so this is the bit then that is a bit more um practically what that looks like in our school and i don't know whether this will be helpful or not i want us to think about or you to kind of understand how that vision has driven our curriculum and then culture in the school so 
when the new curriculum came in a few years ago and when then we had the offset changes and, and all the rest of it in some ways it was quite straightforward for us at that vision we didn't have to think about what we were trying to achieve we had our vision our vision drove the curriculum we want our children to reach the full potentials through high expectations, engagement, respect and dignity. It was there already. So what we did, we looked then at how the curriculum would help us achieve that vision. It wasn't the other way around. We weren't looking for a curriculum. What's our intent? What do we want to do with just the curriculum? We looked at, this is another part of our school. How can the curriculum support us now to achieve our vision? So we looked at that. We looked firstly at the impact. We at the intent, we went straight to impact and we said, what will an SJF child look like when they leave us? What do we want them to be able to do? Children who are, children who can, and children who have. And I'll show you the graphics for that a little bit later on. What, how do we want that St. John Fisher child to shine when they've left us? And finally, we then went back to this thing. So we did this first, we knew the intent. Then we looked at what the impact would be. And then we looked at how. We looked at what were our key curriculum drivers, what are our school priorities, what does the national curriculum tell us we've got to do, and what are offset expectations. So we're realistic, we know it can't just all be what we would like, we know there are things we've got to adhere to, but we make them work for us. So this is our intent. So um, I've not got all these examples for you now, but I'm, I'm happy for people to, sh to share with people if you want. Our curriculum policy begins with this graphic, it's why. So we looked at what is our curriculum about and we looked at it through that lens of our vision. How does it engage? How does it have high expectations? Where's the respect and where's the dignity? And you can see in there what we look for. This is why, this is what our curriculum is all about. We then looked at like implementation. So if you go into that, we looked at what our school priorities were. And we already knew what these were before Offset's new inspection framework turned up. And we've been working on them, some to a greater extent than others. So our school priorities were reading and communication. We believe that that was the key to everything. If they can read, if they can express themselves well in the written form and verbally, these kids can achieve anything. That was really important to us. We were, a priority in our school was teaching, assessment and feedback, relationships, assessment for learning. That was really important to us. What does teaching look like in our school? We knew we wanted to build on that learning. We knew that mastery was there. We knew that that was important to us. And we knew we needed to look at progress across the school. That was something else that was important to us. And this was massively important to us. As a school, we were determined to build resilience in our children. We wanted them to be independent and we wanted them to have metacognitive skills. We wanted them to have what we, we use learning power, which is Guy Claxton's um, way of using metacognition. As the new curriculum came in, as the offset themes came in, we looked at that and we looked at what the themes were going through the offset framework. And we all know reading and vocabulary came out really strongly. Effective use of assessment, that kept coming up. Teachers make assess use of assessment to move children on. Teachers are using assessment to do, that just kept coming through all the time. Oh, knowledge, knowing more and remembering more equals progress. How many times have we heard that in different briefings? That was coming through loud and clear. And attitudes to learning, that was a real thing that kept coming through. What are the children's attitudes to learning? These are things that we knew then. Offset were going to be looking at us and judging us on. And when we looked, you know, really, it, luckily in some ways, it linked. We'd already looked at reading and communication. We now knew that was definitely going to remain in our school as a priority. We'd looked so much at this area of resilience and independence, linked directly to this. We not that we hadn't done these areas, but they weren't perhaps as big a priority for us. We knew now they had to move up the scale and we had to focus on them as well. So from that, we took our curriculum drivers. So in the implementation, down this column here, these are what we're saying, this is how we implement our curriculum in our school. Not just in English, so the reading is not just in English, this goes across every subject. And we looked at what's the rationale for having this as a curriculum driver and then what does that look like in our school okay so if we look at reading and communication we say it's driven through quality literature in every single year group, which it is that's what we did we looked at our curriculum led by books we placed oracy and vocabulary at the heart of the school and how we did that was through phonics 
through the English curriculum. We, we have a reading spine, which we challenge children to, to have read every book in that reading spine by the end of the year. We invested in that. We look at the Odyssey Hub and we have vocabulary grades. So everything was really clearly laid out and we knew why we were doing everything. So the teachers, staff, everyone knew what we were doing, why we were doing it and how we were doing it. And that was really important. This then is the final part of our policy and this is the impact. We know the why and we know how we're going to do it. And if we get it right, this is what it results in. So we've got children who are, children who can and children who have. And you can read through those yourselves there. But, you know, we've got, we've got high expectations for them. We want our children to question things. We don't want them to just accept everything that is given to them. We want them to kind of not argue, but we want them to be, to be able to debate and ask questions, ask, be curious about things. We want them to be respectful. We want them to have solid foundations to build upon, but we don't have we will be expected by the end of year six. That's nowhere in our in our impact. That's not important. But if we get our curriculum right, those things and those children should achieve their potential. So once we had our policy, we knew the why, we knew how, we knew what it was going to look like. We then really looked at the subjects and I was really obviously, I knew our subject leads needed a lot of support. In the past few years, for a long time, English and maths had driven everything in school and all of a sudden every subject leader was going to have to go into a meeting with Ofsted and talk to them about their subject. So we really were careful, we were thinking about them a lot. So we looked at every subject through the lens of curriculum drivers and vision drivers. We had clear aims and a framework for the policy for everyone based on the whole school curriculum policy and as I say I'll share these if you would like. Through the slides I've just showed you, the impact, intent, impact and the uh, implementation, every policy looks the same but it's slightly adjusted depending if it's geography or English or maths, but it makes, it gives the subject leaders confidence um, in what they're doing. We looked at the current provision and we looked at, does this help us achieve the curriculum vision? And we had an honest reflection. So we looked at every subject and we said, what do we need to do in order for each subject to fulfill the, the vision aims? Okay. And these are the things that we found. We needed to have a clear overview of all subjects. There were some subjects going under the radar. There were some subjects that maybe weren't getting done as much as they should or were getting done half-heartedly while we focused on English and maths. We needed to improve the standard of teaching. We needed to improve subject knowledge. That was clear. If we were to have high expectations for all of our staff and children, that needed to improve. And we also needed to audit what we had in school. We needed to know what we had in school and what we needed. So after we'd looked at this and been really honest about it, this is what we did. So we increased leadership capacity to oversee curriculum. As head teacher at the time, I was trying to kind of lead. I had subject leaders, but I was also trying to keep all those subject leaders on track, trying to chase them for action plans, trying to chase them. What, what's happening here? I felt like I was doing an awful lot of running. That's not really what I should be doing. Okay, we're strategic, aren't we? So what we did is we put another layer in. We, in, we advertised, we had a teaching post advertised needed in the school at the time anyway, and we added a TLR post to that and we looked for a curriculum leader. And that curriculum leader now coordinates all the subject leads. She reports back to us as senior leadership team. So she looks at the action plan, she quality assures the planning. She, um, she doesn't quality assure kind of the teaching and everything like that, although it's part of a role as SLT, but she quality assures the subject leadership that was massive and it made such an impact in school. We have um, clear action plans and formats now. Everyone is very clearly knows what they're working on every year and also she facilitates those regular leadership meetings with those subject leaders that I couldn't do, that I would get dragged away from somewhere else. She does that. So no subject goes under the radar anymore. No subject um, can be kind of not done half-heartedly by teachers. We know we've all got the same pressures. We're all, every subject is as important as the other. The next thing we want to do is to improve the standards of teaching. And we did that in a variety of ways. We really looked at CPD, what CPD was going to have an impact um, on our staff. Um, we looked at these staff forums, which was, I don't know if some of you may do them, I don't know. We started off with each week, um, a staff member would lead a 15 minute forum. And when we first began it, we let them have a choice. It was something they were interested in, something they were passionate about. That was in the first year. 
in the second year which was last year it was much more directly around their subject or their area in school they have 15 minutes and they lead a session they teach the rest of their class the uh, staff about their subject or about that important thing in there and um, we looked at creating local networks so within our collaborative of 18 schools we've created science networks we've created um English networks, moderation networks, we've given them support so they're not just on their own in their schools. And this is something that we're still in the middle of kind of embedding in the school is coaching. We started last year with coaching partners and it was a member of the senior leadership team and a teacher. And they worked together to improve an aspect of their teaching. It was really, it was really great. It was really um, targeted. That was good. We're improving that this year and we're moving that coaching element into our appraisal. We need to improve subject knowledge. And this was a bit, an area that we made a massive move in. We looked at the staff strengths as a whole and individuals, and we looked at what our staff were good at teaching and what they possibly weren't as good as teaching. And we made a decision that we had a part-time teacher in our school um, who was part-time in class and we had another part-time teacher filling, and it never quite worked for us. So we took that part-time teacher out of class the PPA person we brought in, we, we, we said, we're not having you anymore. And that one teacher, and a part-time teacher, teaches science from year one to year six. Science was not consistent. Science was hit and miss. Uh, some, some year groups did it really well, some didn't. Some did lots of investigation, some did none. We now have a teacher who does that. It covers PPA, so I'm, I'm, I'm you know, ticking that box. But I've also got someone who's passionate about their subject and right across the school knows exactly where every single child is, I know. The progression in science across our school is really great. We also looked at French, modern foreign languages, it was a week in our school, so we brought someone in. They come in, they do half an hour session with each of our key stage two classes. I know French is looking good, and I also know that every teacher is getting CPD while he's in delivering that session. We also audited our resources. So we looked at the organisation in the school, where was everything? There was half stuff in cupboards, stuff in boxes. We organised that. We got new storage spaces and we also purchased carefully. We asked subject leaders to go back to their action plans. What is it you need? Tell me why you need it, not just it looks nice. What's it going to help you achieve? How will it achieve the vision for your subject? And we also applied for grants. And all of those things were really helpful in moving things forward. Um, we then looked at teaching resources. So we kind of had the subjects in place. What did our staff need to help them teach? What did they need? And these are all some of the things on the board, on the, on the screen there that you can see that we you know, included. And I've got lots of examples. And in the question and answer session, I'll talk about whatever you want to hear. I just thought there might be two areas that might be more of interest to you. One of them was the long-term plans. So our long-term plans, we'd mapped a long time ago, really, around books. So we looked at, it, was, it was, wasn't topics, but we looked at literature as the driver. And what we did with that was we found natural links and we found ways that we could teach objectives in separate subjects through a, a narrative, a book that they were already reading. Now, that was great. We then had a quality assurance review from Challenge Partners in the spring. And one of the things that they asked us to look at was progression. And it was a really valid question. They kind of said to us, if you have a teacher who comes into your school who's new, You've got the plans, okay. How do they know what's gone before? How do they know the links between what's happened in the year before, where they're heading towards? So we went away and we looked at our, our planning and we, we colour co co coordinated it. So we looked at the strands. So if you look at the top there, these are the strands that the national curriculum's telling us we need. Where do those strands pop up in early years? Where does that strand then move on to in year one? And I've not got the whole plans here, but I can show them later if you want. We looked at that, that thread right through the school. It meant that a teacher could look back. So a teacher in year four can look at this plan, look at the objective they're doing in this term and look backwards and find out when did the children last look at that? What did they do when they last looked at that? And actually, where, when my children in year four need to know this, why do they need to know this? What will they need this again in year six? So it gave a really clear thread. And I know the colours are really bright, but it makes it stand out. It's clear. Um, over lockdown, our subject leads did this with the curriculum leader leading that. It means everyone can see where their objective fits in the bigger picture. It also helped them locate which knowledge organiser and retrieval quiz they may need to access. So that was something else we put into place. In year four, the year four teacher could look back and see actually they did that in year two. They can go back and in our, our shared drive, 
pick out the knowledge organizer from year two that addressed that objective. They can share that with the children before the subject starts. So they can say, this is what you've done before. Do you remember when you did this? Remember all this knowledge? There's a quiz that's linked to each of those. They can give them that quiz. It is set that the assessment starts really early and is really focused because we have this information in one place. If we carry on from assessment, this is what we look at before, during and after each unit of work. So we look at assessment as being, we're assessing knowledge, skills and the understanding and application. And the way we do that is we look at the knowledge aspect of it by creating knowledge organisers. And then the children will have regular retrieval quizzes based on those knowledge organisers. And as I said, the teacher can go back to a year previously, make sure they really got that last year's topic before moving on. We also look at the skills in each subject and the teachers have milestones. So linked to each um, half terms unit, there'll be a milestone, something particularly that we want them to assess. The tasks that they give them in class will be linked to show and can, have the children got the skills to achieve those milestones. And then the final part is that understanding and application. That is where we, we show, do they really get it? Knowledge on its own is useless unless you can apply it into, in a different context. And so from this, we have big questions. So throughout the topic, the children will have a big question that they're going to answer. That might be a bit more abstract. It won't just be when was. It won't be a factual yes or no either. It will be one where they've got to think and they've got to use the knowledge, apply the skills they've got to answering this. And we've, we've looked at different ways of doing this, but we've got projects, we've got presentations. We're still working on that. And I think lockdown last year really forced us because we were on our, our way with this a bit more we kind of had to start again this year but that's how we assess that's what the teachers are doing all of the time and then this is the final slide now uh, and this is just an overview really of how we believe that our vision has driven our culture in the school these are things that we've been able to achieve because of our vision uh, and because we've made it central to everything that we do uh, and as I said, I'm not, I don't want to uh, particularly talk about anything unless you would like me to, but I just think the vision, when the vision's right, it impacts on every single area of your school. It impacts, it made our curriculum uh, development easy. It really did. It made looking at behaviour easy. We talked, we've got one code of conduct, we've got, our, we've got one rule in our school and it's at St John Fisher, we show respect and shine. So that links into the values that we've got here it links into that little catchphrase that the kids all know as our vision. It's very easy to remember, but we wouldn't have been able to do that without having this vision so central to our school. It would have been lots of separate things that we did. Um, and so that's where we are. So Georgina, that's the end of my presentation. And I think I'm a little bit ahead of time, which is good. So I know we're at that kind of um, question and answer session. So if anyone has got anything to ask, please feel free. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, yeah, I, th I think if, any, if anyone's got any um, questions or comments, either put them in the, in the chat or um, also just feel free to unmute and, and ask Michelle a question directly. It might be might be easier. Can I just say as an um, um, someone who came into the school with the division already being clearly identified um, as the deputy head teacher, it made my job a lot more straightforward. My job is to ensure that all members and all stakeholders of this community shine. Um, and it, no matter in what we do. So, for example, um, recently I've been at home with a, a group of children who've been isolated, so we've had to do some home learning. Um, and at the end of that, we ensured that we sent a little certificate to our parents saying that at St John Fisher, our parents... Oh, I think he's frozen. Is he frozen for everyone? It's just for me. <laughs> I know, he froze for me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I think what he's saying there because he's still frozen isn't he is the staff now are really good at finding ways to celebrate people who achieve the vision and remind people of what the vision means um, and and celebrate the occasions that they see it wherever it is that's, and that he's really took it on and one of the reasons that we've got such a good deputy in the school is because we looked at who would help us achieve our vision we looked at what we wanted the person not particularly qualifications and experience who's the right person for us to fit in with the vision Thanks, Michelle. We have just got one, um, I think it's a, a question from Shriti, which she put in the chat about 20 minutes ago, um, just saying, when you come up against resistance, even though you've shared the reasoning behind change and, you know, data analysis, pupil voice and pedagogy, what can you do to support staff? 
think yeah, I think it's 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 quite hard because you, do you mean staff who can maybe still are uh, not on board? Y yes, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, I think it was kind of um, I, you know, that repeat button that I showed you before. That's what I felt like. It almost felt like it's not going away. We are going to do it. This is how are we doing this. How are we shining? We kind of did that all the time and went on and on and on about it, and then linked it into other subjects. And bit by bit, those staff came on board. So those ones who were quite negative in the beginning are, are some of the staff now will come to tell me, and they will use the language. Oh, Miss, you have to come down because so and so has just been shining so well. And it, it's a process though and you have to kind of keep at it and almost um at times I felt like all I said was achieve full potential and shine at times I really felt that was the only thing I said across the school but what it meant was it was repeated it was getting into the vocabulary of the school um, and you have to do that I think and you have to have your leadership team around you doing that as well I hope that was helpful Thanks, Michelle. Um, just a comment from uh, Michelle Ginty as well, just saying thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, very clear and thought provoking and lots to think about for her team. Um, I mean, if anyone else ha does have any questions, um, do feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, if not, we can we can wrap up early. I, I will send through a follow up email as well. Um, and I think, Michelle, you were happy to have your contact details put on that. So yes, if you do have any further questions kind of following the session, um, do you know, do please get in touch with with myself or Michelle as well. Um, as well as that on our website, and if you can put a link to that as well, Georgina, um, we do have examples of our, our curriculum policy because I didn't want to get them all up here because there's there's loads of there's lots of documents that I could have shared with you, but there are examples of all of our policies. There's examples of the planning. The planning online doesn't um, have the progression through; it just has the the examples of what's going to happen in each year group. But I'm happy to share that with people or have a, a further conversation because I know it's a massive task. I think that the curriculum. Um, but I know I keep saying it, but because we had that why at the beginning, things did follow. You know, it felt as though we were doing things for a reason, not just because Ofsted told us we had to. That made it much easier. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll pop a link to your website in the email I sent out. Um, send out if that's okay, Michelle. Yeah, just a few more comments coming in, just saying thank you, really helpful, giving me lots of lots to consider with my SLT. Um, lots of ideas about the direction I need to take moving forward. So thank you so much, Michelle. This has been really, really interesting. And it's been so great to see how, how your vision clearly impacts just everything you do in your school at St. John, St. John Fisher. And I think it's been absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much.